Okay, perfect. So um, I think we're ready to start our last event of the day. Uh, I would invite our translators to um, turn on their videos. Yeah, so we can have our, our spotlights going. Hello. Hello, everyone. Yes, come on in. Thank you for being here. Uh, let me see if we can get everyone. Yes, perfect. Great. Uh, so this is our last event for today. It's a translation roundtable. We're going to be talking about the philosophy and practice of literary translation. Uh, many of the themes and the questions that I have prepared uh, for our translators who are joining us today are things that have kind of been cropping up in conversation, I think, all morning in, in a number of different ways, particularly thinking about uh, Marsha's keynote this morning, which I think opened a lot of pathways for us to talk about. So I'm really excited for us to kind of dig into um, the philosophy and the practice. And I always kind of separate these two because I think there is a separation where there is a kind of theory of, of translation that sounds very nice and very pretty. But then when you get into the nuts and bolts and the publishing and the actual process of getting these books out there and how they circulate, things get a little bit messier. Um, so maybe we can we can talk about that. We're joined by uh, three wonderful um, translators, and so I'll do brief uh, bios just to introduce you, and then we can kind of launch into what I hope will be an engaging discussion. And for all of our participants, um, as has been the case all day, please feel free to pop your questions and comments in the chat or you can wait towards the end. We're gonna have a good probably 15, 20 minutes at the end for discussion. Um, and you can raise your hand then and I'll ask, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and you can come in and, and, and join the conversation. So uh, Larry Price is an award-winning literary translator of contemporary Arabic fiction. Price's translation of Samaria's Yazbek's Planet of Clay was a finalist for the 2021 National Book Award for Translated Literature. <laughs> uh, her translation of Khaled Khalifa's Death is Hard Work, which we just heard about from uh, Amira, was also a finalist for the 2019 National Book Award for Translated Literature and winner of the Seif Goba Shibanapal Prize for Arabic Literary Translation. Her translation of Khaled Khalifa's No Knives in the Kitchens of the City was shortlisted for the American Literary Translator Association's National Translation Award as well. And I think the fourth Khaled Khalifa book is coming out soon, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if you can announce that yet, but I saw something about it. Um, but yeah, the official translator for Khaled Khalifa. Uh, Savad Hussain is an Arabic translator passionate about bringing narratives from the African continent to wider audiences. She's a contributor to journals, sorry, she's a contributor to journals such as Arab Lit and Asim Thought and was co-editor of the Arabic English portion of the award-winning Oxford Arabic Dictionary. Her translations have been recognized by English Pen, the anglo omani Society, and the Palestine Book Awards. Her recent translations include Passage to the Plaza by Sahar Khalifa, and A Bed for the King's Daughter by Shahla Ujeli, and Black Foam, most recently, I wanted to plug it, by Haji Jabba, which she co-translated with our keynote speaker this morning, Marsha Lings Quayley, and which comes out in February of 2023. So everybody be on the lookout for that. Um, our, our, our final uh, panelist are joining us for the roundtable is Dr. Pune Shabani Jadidi. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, instructional professor of Persian at the University of Chicago. Her research focuses on teaching and learning Persian as a second language, as well as Persian literary translation. She has published on the practice of translation and has co-edited a volume on translating Persian literature into English. She has co-translated four books to date, including two novels and a poetry collection. Her upcoming books include The Arts of Teaching Persian Literature, The Handbook of Persian Literary Devices, as well as the translation of The Wandering Cameleer, a novel of modern Iran by Sunan Danishvar. And I hope I pronounced that correctly. Please correct me if I didn't. <laughs> uh, so thank you all for joining us. Um, I wanted to kind of uh, jump off with a, a rather general question, I suppose, that kind of uh, starts from this philosophy of translation. Um, 
and, and we can we can think about this in terms of translation studies. Uh, a lot of my students here, their their initial entry point into translation is Walter Benjamin's The Task of the Translator. Um, and so I wondered if we can start with this idea of the fidelity or the responsibility that a translator has to the text, uh, thinking about the translator's invisibility slash visibility and how that um, maybe changes between philosophy and practice, and really the translator's agency or role as a mediator uh, in the text. And so how do you think of yourself and your roles as translators in light of, of these considerations, of this kind of tension between the philosophy of it and the actual practice of it? And anybody can, can feel free to jump in. You all, uh... I can unmute. Okay, I will jump in. Um, firstly, thanks for having us, Leila and Lindsay and everybody else here. Yeah, I'm really excited to be on this panel. Um, I think in terms of, yeah, what I've grown to sort of be comfortable with as a translator when working, you know, between Arabic and English is that there will, like, there will be difference. It's okay. Like there will be difference, not only on like a, a line level, but maybe at, at a greater level as well. And sometimes it's more than I would want, as we were speaking this morning with Marsha in, in, in as, you know, the keynote that a lot of the paratext um, is decided by the publisher. And unfortunately, sometimes it comes down to how, um, I guess stubborn you want to be as a translator uh, in arguing your corner uh, in, in terms of something changing uh, or being added or taken away. So, um, you know, you might even, you might start with the best of intentions, but the, sometimes you're up against so many other people, whether it's like the marketing team, the editor, the head of house, et cetera, that you can only say no so many times. Um, even if you are a lot of the time, because a lot of the authors I work with don't have agents, like I'm representing them. Um, and yet still, you know, you just, because otherwise like the, you know, he's never really said, but if you don't go along, you're afraid the book won't come out in English. Right. So, um, but in my actual practice, I'm, I'm happy with difference in terms of, you know, I think before when I first started, I was staying too close to the Arabic. And then as I went along, I was to free and now I'm just kind of like you want the same emotion same atmosphere same sort of you know reaction uh maybe not at all the same points but that's what I'm trying to go for is 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 what I try to work towards is more so the sort of bigger things as opposed to like you know online level yeah I think that's um a really good point so I'd actually about sort of you know, the anxiety over how much to like keep and, and the fact that it, it's okay, like you're recreating something and, you know, you have a responsibility to your reader in English as well to um, like you, you're creating a novel, you're creating a work of fiction, you're not creating like an academic text to compare side by side. Um, and, you know, I think, I mean, you know, um, Dr. Shabani Shadidi, you'll you know, as somebody who's taught translation, I haven't, I don't have much of a theoretical background in, in translation, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, there's, there's lots of, I mean, translation, I think is interesting from a philosophical point of view, you know, also from an intercultural point of view, you know, that's, that's my academic background. And, you know, there's so much to say about what can be expressed in one language and what can't be expressed in another, you know, my research deals with home. And of course, you know, house and home and English are, different words and in Arabic they aren't um, you know and the concepts and and things are, are they don't quite map onto each other and there, there will always be something that can't be expressed quite as succinctly or as poetically in one language and another as, as it can be in another but um, you know I think you know we can we can talk all day about the things that are lost but I think you know what is also really important to remember is what's gained in translation and that is the fact that we in its I hesitate to say imperfections but like you know even when it takes a form that 
you know, doesn't necessarily conform to an ideal, um, we have access to these texts, you know, um, that we wouldn't otherwise do. Um, and I think that is something to be really um, you know, embraced and, and cherished. Um, may I? So I, I think I agree with, with both of you in that, um, in that we are, uh, our role is to translate or let's say to recreate, um, I think Sawad mentioned the word recreation, to recreate the message of the source text in, the, in, the, in our target text. Um, for me, because I have a linguistic background, of course, I see everything through this linguistic lens. I remember when I got my bachelor degree in translation in Iran, we had this ceremony, graduation ceremony, and then they made us swear that we're going to be faithful to the text. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. Um, so, for me, <laughs> so for me, exactly. So for me, fidelity to the text is um, deep rooted in my mind, and I try to be as close to the text as possible without making it artif sounding artificial um, as a target text production comes out. Um, sometimes this is not that easy because for example, for Persian classical poetry, um, we have the form and aesthetics of the, of the source text. We also have the, the content and the message. And then most of the translators, they sacrifice one for the other one to live. For me, it depends on the text, on the, on the readers, on, um, on my purpose of translation. Um, for example, um, one of the books that we translated with my co-translator, Hafez in Love, um, it's written by a modern um, Persian writer, Iraj Pezesh So it's a novel, uh, made up novel about Hafez's life but he incorporates, intertwines um, different um, poems by Hafez, by Saadi, by Obedi Zakani, by more um, classical uh, Persian poets. So when it came to the, and then these had, um, I mean, the most important thing about adding those poems was that they would help with the story. So what was important was not the beauty or the aesthetics of the, of the poems of Hafez, but rather to get the story um, across to the reader so that they can bind the text with the poetry. So I think the most important um, consideration for me at least is that to make these choices is um, the, the target, um, so the audience and the purpose of translation um, as well as you know trying to be um, to be loyal, to be fiddle to the to the text as much as possible. Um. That's that's really interesting, and I, I I think it's interesting to have your um, your understanding of it from a more scholarly linguistic point of view as well. Um, I think that that adds a, a, another dimension. Um, but I guess um, you know, in talking about this idea of fidelity, of course, we can we can talk about you know what fidelity means, um, and I suppose it would be okay to have different understandings of of the word or what it what that responsibility is. But in thinking about that. Um, in terms of the translator's visibility or invisibility. The transla translators, particularly literary ones, have become more visible um, in recent times. And there's been this whole push, which I think is very necessary, of having the translator's name, you know, having them accountable on the cover, whereas before, you know, you might not even have the translator's name appearing anywhere. And so do you think that for you as translators being more visible and in some ways being more accountable for the choices that you're making, um, do you find that 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 falls that falls in well with your kind of natural inclination to align yourself with the author anyway, and to kind of, as Sabad was saying, be an advocate for the author? Um, it kind of, I mean, if you were both in the same camp, that kind of that visibility kind of firmly roots you in in one camp when there are so many cooks in the kitchen, you know, with the publishers and the editors and and the way the text might be packaged. That's really interesting, actually. That um, I hadn't thought of it at all from that perspective, Leila. Um, but I, I, I understand what you mean, actually. Actually, I was thinking about um, that where there's been, you know, um, but I'll be, I, I won't bring it up here, but, um, you know, where there's been 
uh, disagreements between translators and um, publishers, and you know they've actually had to have put their name to a text that they didn't want to, um, and you know, and, and they were also in, in um, disagreed with, with the author as well. So I mean, but I understand what you mean about it. You're sort of you're in the like it, it. It's literally it's your name. Like you know, you can't hide away. Um, yeah, I agree. I think it is really important to have accountability. Um, you know, I mean, I think the whole visibility of the translation that's been happening at the moment is, you know, it's not just about, you know, oh, more glory for the translators. Um, although I do wish translators had more glory, but, um, you know, it's also weirdly, I think it, it does, it does more of a service to the author as well, because, you know, I think there's this sense of, you know, like the text comes through this like conduit and you know it's magically it comes from Arabic or Persian or whatever and then it appears in English and oh you know how wonderful you know this is exactly what Khalid Khalifa wrote in Arabic but in English oh brilliant and um you know and it's not how it works we all know how that's not how it works um and you know I think in some ways weirdly having the translator more visible is, is not just about the translator it's also about the author because it it shows that you know I mean there could be other translations of Khalid's work out there which are completely different um you know I know that there's been so, like in um Syria Speaks there's a translation of the first chapter I think of No Knives and I haven't read it because <laughs> I'm just I'm, I'm too nervous to I, mean, I don't even read my own translations when they're published but um you know I think it would be interesting to compare the two and to see that actually translation is, you know, the, if, I, I don't know if I'm expressing myself very well, but, um, you know, there's, it, it does a disservice to the author to say that these are exactly the word or to imply that these are exactly the words that were written because they're, they're not. And the translator has to take responsibility as well for, um, for their mediating role. Yeah, exactly. For their mediating role. Yeah, precisely. I don't have anything to add here, so maybe Puni would like to add something. Um, so I can just add about the um, the translations of classical, more classical Persian poetry. For example, Fitzgerald's translation of Omar Khayyam, which is totally a different, different um, language, a different you know, um, different book. I can say. So the idea is there, but the words, the style, everything else is different. And both of them are beautiful. I mean, Hayam is so beautiful and elegant in Persian. So is Fitzgerald when you read it in English. Um, but I, I don't know whether I agree with going that far, to be that far away from the, from the, uh, the text, the original text. So um, probably there can be a kind of a, you know, mediation in between. But um, about the visibility and visibility, um, um, I know that now there is like uh, th there is a trend that we have to make translators more visible, like um, you know Venuti's foreignization and domestication, like whether we have to foreignize the text. Do I actually consciously think about this when I translate? Not really. I mean, if it do you? I, I don't know. I mean, um, I think sometimes it requires that we keep a word foreignized. Like, for example, if it doesn't exist in English, if ren does it, doesn't exist, if saqi doesn't exist, if, you know, qayrat, maybe in Arabic you have this word. So there are certain words that we don't have them in English. So I don't know, maybe it's not a bad idea to foreignize them. But in general, um, in general, I, I don't think, I don't make a conscious decision whether to be visible or invisible. I think uh, that would be my answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. And, and Sabad and I have talked about in, in uh, one of our Minawa discussions about keeping Arabic in the translated text. Um, and uh, in Semar Yezbek's Planet of Clay, there, there's a number of words as well that, Larry, that you- Arabic that, text, yeah. That, yeah, there's whole Arabic mm -hmm. text, but, but I'm, I'm writing a chapter on the book and, and particularly the word hurma 
uh, like the sanctity of a woman is kept in Arabic because it has certain references and it brings certain connotations along with it that are that there's simply no equivalent mm. for in English. And so it's kept in Arabic. And, and, you know, I think that there's value in having that as a deliberate act. Um, That's brilliant. Yeah, um, to, to, to move on to the, to the next question that I had, we were, we were talking earlier this morning and in and, and, um, Marsha's keynote and in a number of the papers, we were talking about this manipulation and packaging of translated Arab literature for an Anglophone audience. And that practice from Arabic to English is very well documented with examples from Nawal al-Sa'dawi, Hanan al-Sheikh, uh, I talk about it with Ghada Saman and the way that, you know, the, 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 the writer that Arabic speakers read and know is not the writer that Anglophone readers come to know. Um, and, and those examples that we talk about that, that we kind of highlight all the time are rather old. They're from the 80s and 90s. And so with, with Larry and Savad, maybe if we can talk about is this situation changing? It, do you think it's changing because the, the translators themselves are more, you know, hybrid, have maybe a deeper cultural understanding of the context of the Arabic speaking world? Do you have, you know, any specific examples that come to mind where, where you know, this situation is changing? Um, and for Pune, I would I would be really interested to know if this is a trend as well in Iranian literature translated into English. Uh, Raha's paper talked about memoirs, and she talked interestingly about how some of these packaging techniques are used for Iranian memoirs that appear in English. Um, so yeah, I would I would be interested to to hear your your thoughts on on this manipulation and repackaging of text. Yeah, I was giggling because I'm very excited for this question. Um, <laughs> and it's because I've just had so many different instances of this happening. So like the most recent one was I did a, a short story collection for Najwa bin Shatwan, who's a Libyan author. And um, what ended up happening is so we got to the discussion of the cover, right, of this short story collection. And, you know, the editor um, had said, okay, like, I think we're going to go with a desert scene. And um, I just wrote back and I was like, I was so confused. I, and, I, and I wrote to the co-editor as well. And I was just like, why? There's no mention of any desert at all, like in this book. I'm just so... I said, I just, I just, I said, could you, I said it in like a more, I couched it more, you know, in a way like, oh, could you perhaps like explain why you feel the need like to put a desert when I said there, you know, there isn't any mention of it. And then I it came back with like, um, basically they then realized that that's, they were very then more accommodating. But then what ended up happening is that they ended up choosing a cover that both the author and I did not agree with. We strongly fought back. We're told no this is the cover we're going with and that was it so going forward what I realized is I need to put a clause in each of my contracts saying that I will be consulted on the cover and yeah you don't have to go with the one that I'm going with but I do need to be shown it and the author also needs to have that clause in their contract as well because it's something that we just assumed that we would be consulted about right so there was that um with also again with Najwa's writing, there was another a sort of aspect more on a like linguistic level, a line level where they wanted, she, she writes very playfully. And so one of the lines is like, one of the stories starts out with, um, you know, a, a house which was up to its nose with daughters, right? And, and the editor was like, what is this expression? Like, what does this mean? How does this make any sense? Do you mean like up to their, up, like, up to their head or something? I'm like, no, this is what it is in Arabic. Like you get the sense there's just so many daughters in the house, right? And so, I had to fight to keep something like that in. And so that was like throughout this, you know, um, collection. So there's also, you know, on a sort of linguistic level about how the writing should be, which I haven't come across so often with my, with other works, I guess I would say. Um, but yeah, covers are generally a, a real discussion and I'm having to advocate for the author. And then 
Um, most recently, as March, I was you know, mentioning the, the book that we both have co-translated, there was a, a very heavy developmental edit process, which I have never experienced to this extent, where you know, changing things like narrative pace, um, characters' motivations, fleshing those out. Um, it was just, uh, I guess, um, very surprising for me, but they really, this is a bigger house that wants to make it fit within a particular frame of how they think this book should be, should, should be read. And the author was on board because the author wants the book to be the best it can be in English. And, you know, he said that I'm sure that these editors have more experience than me in this aspect, in this respect. And like, so I, you know, if, if both you and Marsha think it, it makes sense, then we'll go with it. But I was like, at the end of the day, like, you know, I'm going to go with what you as the author want to do because it's your book, right? Um, unless I have like a really strong, you know, objection to it. But yeah, it really varies. And then there's some houses um, like right right now, the one at the, the nonfiction book I've done for Fitzcarraldo, which is coming out, What Have You Left Behind, um, where they're so considerate and just, I mean, I don't know how they are with, I know there's a whole thing about they don't put translators on the cover and there's a lot of other criticism about them. But in this respect, I would say they are like the most respectful editors I have worked with when it comes to a book translated from Arabic, yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question, yeah. but yeah, I'm happy to go into more examples later, but I think I'll let um, Puni and Larry like jump in. Um, wow, yeah, no, I mean, that's, um, yeah, I think let's let's champion some excellent publishers. Um, mm -hmm. World Editions are just amazing. Um, you know, we published Planet of Clay with them. We're doing Summer of Yezbeck's next book with them. Um, you know, I think um, it wouldn't surprise, I mean, you know, I haven't published enough to draw, like, a, have a vast sample, but I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if, smaller or like independent presses tended to be a bit more accommodating of uh unusualness um just more adventurous yeah exactly um I to think outside the the veiled box <sighs> yeah <laughs> yeah i remember the first edition the american cover of in praise of hatred of course i mean someone's done a wonderful cover on this an article where they just have all of the books of Arabic translations and they're just all veiled women mm -hmm. and you're just like oh my god anyway um it's a cookie cutter it just gets stamped onto the yeah book. it's just everywhere mm -hmm. um if I, I think for good measure with that cover of in praise of hatred I think there was like a desert behind the woman and it's in Damascus I mean it's anyway um desert of their minds yeah, let's, oh, anyway, um, <laughs> but I mean, that was a long time ago. Now. And to be honest, like I have to say, like over the last, um, how long have I, 12 years, um, I think I've noticed that there is uh, like more of an understanding from um, just editors and people in general of this sort of, um, I think it's part of broader social movements as well, where, you know, whose stories get told and in what way and there's there's more of an understanding I think of like the dynamics of particularly the language of somewhere which has been colonized by the English-speaking world and then translating that into English um you know I think that I mean I, I wouldn't say there's like you know been you know total enlightenment everywhere but I, I would say that there is more receptiveness now um, you know, when it's brought up, even if people, I mean, and that's just, you know, part of how change happens, isn't it? Is, um, and that I think is very positive. Um, you know, I think there is, I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, for, I've had a, a um, you know, in, edit, in the, I have a book at the moment that's in the editing stage and you know, the editor at first said, I've got so many queries for you. I've got a lot, we've made quite a lot, it's quite a heavy edit. And I was like, oh my God, what is gonna like, what's gonna happen? Um, and I came back and I have to say, basically what's happened is that they've just sort of like swapped the halves of the sentences around, you know, because like syntax is different in Arabic and I've sort of um, sort of stuck a bit too closely, I guess, to the Arabic in places. And, but I mean, I, I, was, I was like, this is, you know, this is fine. You know, I was expecting, um much more insensitive um changes and no I mean I've been very pleasantly surprised actually um 
And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really looking forward actually to how that book's going to turn out. Um, although I will say um, one thing I was surprised about is that people were like there has been mention of a glossary made quite an extensive. Yeah, yes. I can see from all your faces. You had the same reaction as me. Um, I did write back in quite strong terms about my opinion of that, which mm -hmm. was not a positive one. Um, but, you know, I. I understand it's set in a it, it's not like you know it's also set in a different historical era so um you know but I, I sort of explained and laid out you know look there is a very long and ignominious history of glossaries and of you know reading anything from you know the Minawa regions as some sort of anthropological study and you know, if you incorporate a glossary, I mean, character list is one thing because, you know, you get those in lots of different books. But I mean, you know, I read books where I don't know what people are eating or like the finer distinctions of what they're wearing or like, you know, I didn't know for years and years and years that, you know, Gangnam was a suburb of Seoul, you know, and I've still managed to you know be enjoy the book by the song without you know the without understanding like the fact that it was a satire on this consumeristic society like you know it's fine it's okay like I'd, it's you know like you were saying earlier Layla like you know the readers will be fine like I I do it and I'm okay like I still enjoy reading the book I still get things from it so um yeah so sorry glossaries I just went a bit off track there um <laughs> But yeah, so, you know, we don't, we don't need them. Nothing needs explaining, nothing needs. And, you know, and again, like in terms of this social, sorry, I will stop talking after this. Um, I've just realized I'm gonna start on a slightly disconnected rant actually, which I have already talked about at length later in the last um, talk we did about how people read the Middle East. So I'm gonna stop talking here because now I'm not talking about the, the industries, we're talking about how people receive the books, which is a slightly different question. But um, anyway, sorry. Um, please, okay, is there some <laughs> should he please in? stop me talking? I can talk about this for a long time. I love it. I'm happy to listen. Um, yeah, I can. Um, I can mention some. Well, one one or two books that I know of. I've I've seen that the title of the book has completely changed because the publisher wanted it to. Mm. For example, and then that changes the whole thing because, for example, I can give you an example. Um, the title of the book in Persian was. I will turn off the lights. And then it was translated, the translation uh, title became things that were left unsaid. So it's very poetic, but it's not that. So I don't know whether we have to make this kind of drastic change. And then also there are certain books that are translated more than once by more than one translator. And then each of them has a different, obviously, um, title for that. So one I can mention is Simena Daneshwar's um, most famous book, Suvashun. One uh, was Suvashun by Ranum Parvar, and then after that, in a, in a year or so, by another person, Roxana Zand, as um, a Persian requiem. So um, yeah, so these, um, th these decisions are sometimes imposed by the publishers. I myself, probably we were lucky. We didn't, we were always, um, we didn't have that much, you know, um, objection against what we, what we wanted on the cover. We always chose the cover ourselves, the title ourselves, but probably because, maybe because we worked with mostly uh, university presses. Mm -hmm. um, the yeah, only thing- I was uh, noting in the yeah. chat, it, there's more freedom with an academic press maybe. Exactly. The only thing is for the latest book, Island of Bewilderment, we wanted a, a cover, an image of um, a painter, Sorab Saperi, who was mentioned in the, in the book, in the novel. And then we sent it to them. And then they said, no, we have a better one, which was a black, you know, all black with just a bit of yellow and a bit of red, which me and my co-translator, we didn't like it. But anyway, they decided, thankfully, to thank God that they decided to change it themselves to something uh, less black. So I don't know if there is a something, an idea, a more important underlying idea behind that they want to show Iran black, or whether it was just they thought that is nicer, which we didn't agree with, but thank God they changed it. So yeah, that, that's what I can say. <laughs>
interesting that both of you have been consulted on covers I've literally I've never been consulted on a cover for any of my books ever it's just I mean half the time I've only oh. ever seen them when they're when they're published yeah um I, yeah I think I might t- I might take a leaf out of your books then and say I'm going to put it in my contract because I do have opinions on them I mean I'm not a marketer but um it would be nice to sort of see because I think also that has a bit of an idea in how how the publisher sees it because um you know, because also I, I really, I don't want to sort of get into this position where it's like translators against publishers, you know, like we're on opposite teams um, because, you know, I've worked with some absolutely delightful editors and, um, you know, and I, I find I'm, that generally, even when we have um, differences of opinions, like, you know, I, you know, it's all in good faith. And I think there's, 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 you know, people genuinely, want to do the best that they can by the book um even if we all have different ideas about what that is so um you know I I definitely don't want to um be uh yeah so to sort of set up that sort of false binary there um I was a point to this sorry I'm just started rambling again oh my gosh um all right I'm, I'm gonna stop talking um, I mean I think it sounds like you know that a, like what we were talking about before is that there's a lot of murkiness in this process, mm. which I think the visibility of the translator is helping with. Mm. Um, but B, it sounds like there actually needs to be more control given to the authors and the translators, like contractually, you know, because I mean, just, yeah. just as an author, my, my publishing contracts stipulate that I do need to be consulted on these things because at the end of the day, it's your name that's going on the book. And so, yeah, I mean, you're you're the translator, but at the end of the day, the book is being attributed to Huda Barakat and to Khaled Khalifa and to Samari Azbek and what they think. And the authors are answerable to the translations of their text. It's not as though the, the text, I mean, yes, Khaled Khalifa had this, this beautiful quote in, in that interview where he says that it does take on another life in a language. But at the end of the day, he's the one who's answerable, whether the text is in English or French or German or Italian. Um, That's true. And so I they think, do, I I think will. he has some agency there. I imagine he probably will because um, Khalid Khalifa and Samar Yazbek are both represented by Yasmina. Yasmina. Yasmina Jusati. Um, mm-hmm. So I imagine that they will have some input through, through her. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely gonna make sure I have some input too in the future. <laughs> Uh, there's some there's some interesting conversations or, or comments happening in the chat. Um, so I'll I'll bring a little bit of that in. Um, I guess Lindsay, maybe your question was directed to Pune about the pressures for non-contemporary literature or translating non-contemporary literature. So the the more classic um, literature, if there's more freedom in that, less freedom. For you as a translator, maybe? I don't know if Lindsay wants to jump in and, and kind of elaborate on her question. I don't really know how I would elaborate on that. I'm just thinking a lot of what we're talking about is to do with a kind of, res- well, post-millennial reception politics. And I wondered whether classical literature of, well, you know, in the broad sense, was relatively immune to these things or whether it has its own kind of pressures, perhaps in terms of formal style for example. Um, actually, um, a lot of translators of the classical Persian poetry of the 19th century, mostly um, 19th century, they, they were um, criticized of being um, too Orientalist and um, making their translations sound um, exotic, while the Persian, actually, the, the, the source text is not that, it's more mystical. Um, there are so many layers in classical Persian poetry and uh, so many metaphors and allusions that it's a very difficult task to do. So um, like I, I mentioned in that novel that we translated, it's that the task wasn't, well, maybe it was a bit simpler because we just wanted to, you know, put across the, the message. We weren't worrying about making it as beautiful as Hafez, like when I, as a Persian speaker, I read Hafez, it's just, it brings you to the, to the skies. But 
whether our English translation is doing that, I'm sure it's not. <laughs> so um, that is something very difficult to do. So I think it's uh, for, for uh, classical poetry, the task at hand is even much more difficult. I did some, um, the Sorab Seperis of Modern Poets, the translation of his was also difficult because of the, um, the strangeness, well, the, um, he, he wanted it to sound strange, but the strangeness and the novelty of the expressions he was using. So when we translated, um, sometimes people would think that it's our translation that is being strange or sounding, you know, strange while it's actually the original is the same. And that was the choice of the, um, of the poet, of the source text uh, producer. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so we were trying to be faithful kind of to the text. I wonder if you had the same issue with uh, Death is Hard Work, Larry, or was that like the reception of it, it didn't seem that strange in terms I mean, of the prose style? The prose style? Yeah. I mean, it's odd, isn't it? Because it's so different from his other work. Um, and I mean, you know, that was a conscious decision on his part. You know, I think, I, I think there's a few reasons. Well, and I'm actually going to link this back as well to the, what we were talking about, about the marketing of Arabic literature. Um, I think both the prose style and the fact that it's about the, the ongoing conflict in Syria, um, you know, I, I think there's a reason why it's the novel of his that's sort of gained the most attention. Um, you know, it, it's a style of writing which is very accessible, which is much more accessible than his earlier work. And it's about something that people can immediately relate to. I mean, um, you know, if people sort of are a bit more aware of the, the conflict at the moment than they are about, um, you know, the rise of the Ba'ath Party all the you know ideals of the 60s of you know pan-arabism or anything like that um and yeah so i yeah it's a bit difficult really um because i think it, it's a it's a i i definitely found it a, a much more different experience translating because i found it much less, um, well, I mean, it's just more direct. It's just more urgent. The sentence structures are completely different. They're much more like familiar, I think, to, um, to English speaking readers than um, the sentence structures that, you know, he normally writes in, that Khaled normally writes in. Um, yeah, it was it was a really interesting book. I'm really um, it, it was it, it's definitely interesting to see now how he's like the. I, I remember like I can't remember if it was in a conversation or in a talk, but I, I know at some point I've heard heard Khalid say that it was almost like in brackets that book mm -hmm. um, for him, and you know the the book that was published most recently, No One Prayed Over Their Graves, um, and the one that I'm working on um, that will hopefully come out next spring. Um, is sort of back to his earlier style, but I can see echoes of death is hard work of the style in there. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's very interesting. It's very interesting to have the opportunity to work consistently over one writer's yeah. work. Yeah. yeah, I was just gonna say, you should write something about that. Like, I would love to read your reflections uh, on translating. Uh, there, there is a question in the chat about that, uh, that kind of links back to, uh, to what we were talking about before uh, in terms of the translator's visibility and writing um, a translator's note or a reflection, you know, that goes in in the translated text, either at the start or at the end. And, and these seem to be quite popular, at least with um, Arab literature in English translation, um, you know, there, there seemed to be a lot of these translators notes, whether it was Nancy Roberts for Ghada Salman or um, uh, for Mirala Bahawi, who the translator's name escapes me, Calderbank. Um, but anyway, there was this kind of translator's note reflecting on the process of translating the text and 
you know, maybe in some ways, um, introducing the author to an unfamiliar audience, contextualizing it a little bit. Um, what are your thoughts on, on having translators notes? Because they seem to be, to have fallen a little bit out of style, although I could be mistaken. Um, but yeah, what are, your, what are your thoughts on translator's notes? Marsha saying that she, because they were talking about Alice Guthrie's notes. Um, yeah, which I think was amazing. Yeah, um, and Marsha was saying that it's important to note that it was at the end versus the beginning. So maybe we can talk about translator's notes. Yes, no, where do we put them? Yeah, I'm for, I'm for translator's notes, but not perhaps for every book. Um, I've done one for the Shahla Ujjeli collection that I did because I thought it was imperative to explain how that book came into English. Um, it's very, it's like a microfiction collection um, of, of short stories. And then I did one for Najwa's book, the other short story collection, uh, talking about translating humor, but that was online. So I think it's also like, you know, uh, it doesn't always have to be in the book itself, which could be for logistical reasons, because sometimes, you know, you don't have time to write the note in order to make it into the publication date. So you could do something online, or I've also done one in the form of like a podcast um, sort of interview. But sometimes, and I just feel this specifically because it's, it's also my first nonfiction work. The one that's coming out, the What Have You Left Behind by Bushra al um, which is a collection of um, war accounts from uh, people who have lost their loved ones in Yemen. Uh, I don't want to put a translator's note in the book because I, I feel like it would detract from the accounts of the people who are sharing what has happened to them. So, you know, I was talking about this with, 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 with the house and I'm happy to have like interviews and talk about other stuff, but I, I personally, well, first of all, it's interesting in the German edition, they've put an introduction to introduce Bushra to the German audience, which I don't think is necessary. I don't think we need to introduce Bushra in the English edition by having some academic bring her in. So I have vetoed that. And then I've also just said, I don't want to put a translator's note in the book because I think like, I don't know, because it, if maybe because it's nonfiction, but I just feel like the voices them should stand on, on their own um, it, and they do. And I don't want to marginalize that in any way. Um, so yeah, but I love reading translator's notes. I mean, I wish I could just have a whole book of translator's notes. Uh, I say a collected of edition. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I would love to hear what my co-panelists think. Kune? Yeah, um, I'm for translator's note. <laughs> well, both me and my co-translator, my co-translator, Patricia Higgins, who is an established um, uh, professor, author, and um, translator. Um, she's, a, she's an anthropologist. I'm a linguist. So both of us believe in translator's note. I mean, she thinks she believes that whatever that the um, American readers would not know about the author or the text or the historical background, you know, we have to give them an introduction so that they become familiar with it. If we are, if we um, would like our, our book to be read by more readers. So that, that is um, our idea. And then my idea, because I, I have a linguistic background, um, for me, I think glossary is very important because as I, I was telling you the word, for example, qayrat, I don't know if you have it in Arabic or not, but qayrat means chivalry. But chivalry, not in the American, in the English sense, but in the Persian sense. And it's kind of, um, well, it has a lot of semantic load associated with it that just writing qayrat or just translating as chivalry would not do it justice. So I think for such words, so if, if as, a, um, as a Persian language um, you know, reader, if I have a concept formed in my mind, and then as an English reader, that concept is not formed in your mind, then you know, we are not enjoying the same way, or we, we do not get, you do not get the same um, the message that I am uh, making. So I think to, to recreate the um, the source text into the target text and to help the target text reader to imagine what the source text reader is imagining is important. And that's why I'm for it. But I'm not for footnotes. I don't like footnotes because for a novel, for a novel. 
but for our nonfiction, we had to put a lot of, we have to add a lot of um, gaps because of course, obviously it was a history book and it needed more explanation. Mm -hmm. Or for the poetry book, we also needed to add more footnotes because um, it needed so, as I said, it was a strange way of, you know, collocations and novel expressions. Uh, also, the publisher, Brill, wanted us to add a lot of footnotes. So yeah. that's partly on us and partly on the publisher. That's interesting. I, I have to say, with like history books and things like that, I agree, footnotes, because there's nothing more annoying than having to like flick to the end of the book and read a really interesting footnote and then read forward and then everything gets a bit lost. Um, that's interesting what you were saying about uh, like having a source text reader and a target text reader having the same experience because actually and again this is probably informed by my my academic work which is nothing to do with but well, loosely um attached to translation um but like you know there is a, sorry I don't know if that was my connection going a bit oh, funny there. um you know I think there are some times where you won't always capture those nuances and you know they, it won't happen and I don't know like I think it's it's okay um like I personally am all right with the idea of um you know a reader not necessarily like you know different like um I think it might have been something that you were saying earlier in a, oh, I can't remember. Oh, I know, I've, I've heard it recently. I can't remember if it was today at the conference or, um, but you know, when, when you're talking about there are different readers who get different things from a text and, you know, like an Arabic speaking reader who's reading the English translation will catch those nuances, but, you know, someone, else probably wouldn't um and you know, every reader has a different takeaway from the text and you know I remember reading a short story years ago um and I, I translated it and you know somebody who I was discussing it with we had completely different interpretations of you know it was it was someone who um oh gosh it was so long ago now it's published in Banipal um, and it was basically, it was a story about um, a man whose father was an alcoholic and um, he, I think he, is, it was something along the lines of like, he gave his father a last drink at his wedding. And then the next day the father died. And, you know, we, I mean, I, I might read that differently now, but I remember at the time thinking that it was almost like the son's revenge on the father, you know, oh, it's so important to you. Like, here you go. It'll kill you. And he, like you know, the person I was discussing it with, like read it as like a last act of love, like you know, instead of fighting, just like just give into it one last time before this man dies. And you know, that's an interpretation rather than cat. But you know, they're all built up from these words, right? That have these different nuances for different people. And I think it's okay if not everything is caught. But yeah, I agree that it means that there is some stuff lost, which is. A shame and like totally I completely understand why for poetry is it because I mean poetry is you know it's a completely different reading experience and it has a different purpose and etc etc um but yeah no it is I, but sorry I think we're talking about translators notes weren't we anyway yes I'm pro <laughs> translators notes <laughs> yes yeah. I do like them but yeah I, I agree with so there's a there's a there's a time and a place for them um I remember reading a really interesting one that um the you know, that Humphrey Davis wrote for um, being Abbe Salabd, which I mean, was a long time ago now. Um, and I really enjoyed it because it was a very sort of playful reflection on, you know, I mean, the, the language in, in, all, in both Arabic and English is just very playful and it's full of, it's very fizzy. And um, I mean, I don't know how contemporary, I assume it would still feel contemporary. I mean, it was a long time ago that I read it when it came out. I mean, it was it 15 years ago now, I think, or something. Um, anyway, but, you know, and I, I loved sort of reading about his thought process. So not just his philosophy of translation, but also, you know, like the word, literally the word choices that he chose and why, and, you know, 
I mean, obviously, you know, I think we all could have listened to Humphrey talk about his translation for, you know, um, yeah, time. Um, and uh, yeah, there is a, um, but yeah, there, I, th I think there is a, a definite market for this book that we're now planning about reflections on translation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think I think it would go a long way towards uh, you know dissipating some of this murkiness that we keep talking about. Um, you know, languages are fiddly things and they're tricky things, and and they are vessels and conduits of culture, and they they bring so much um, so much baggage and so much cultural reference and. Um, and there's an effective quality there. I don't know how much of an abridgment or a glossary would do justice to a word like harma. You know, you can explain that for pages, the word, you know, harma as a sanctity of the woman, but it doesn't, it doesn't bring, I, I don't know how effective it would be in bringing the piercing quality that it immediately kind of in the back of, of an Arab woman's mind, it touches on so many nerves. I don't know how much of that meaning can come across to an individual who is not of that culture. Um, and at that point, one questions what the purpose of glossing it is. I mean, Ahdaf Suwaif writes in English, but she has these enormous glossaries where she just you know, annotates things for, for an Anglophone audience. Um, I don't know. It's it's a question. It's it's an open question, I think, and 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 people certainly have different opinions about it. Um, we're coming up pretty much to the end of time. We have about three minutes, so I don't know if anybody wants to jump in with a very quick question. Faisal had a um, question, Lila. Faisal has a quick question with a lot of text coming out in English now. Any thoughts about the reverse process of bringing text to Arabic? So English to Arabic translation, I guess, which is a rather big market. I yeah. Think. So what I'm friends with a few English to Arabic translators, and I attended this workshop, and her name is escaping me. She's a Kuwaiti author, Leila. No, not Bufaina. Like um, she wrote, she just wrote a, a book, and there's like a sign Maybe on it. In no she's she's very contemporary and she always puts on twitter like translating poetry in the morning like her uh you know and she translates oh. the poetry it's like these short videos anyways um iman yes iman, iman. thank you iman of yusuf thank you so much Marcia. yeah so she ran this brilliant workshop on translating um uh, her experience because you know she's done margaret atwood and like all these really big authors from english into arabic and specifically translating metaphor and and um, similes and turns of phrase. And through the works that she was showing us, she was showing us her, like, her actual drafts and you know, published pieces, there were so many footnotes. And for me, you know, cause I don't, I don't read a lot of, actually, I don't think, I mean, very few Arabic texts translated from English. So I'm just reading usually Arabic texts written in Arabic. So, um, and that's, she, she, you know, that was one of the sort of solutions given that's actually quite popular is putting in footnotes. Um, so, which doesn't seem to, I don't know how readers respond to it, but uh, that was just something that I, I, I came across. Whereas, you know, generally, as we discussed, it's frowned upon to, found, frowned upon to have footnotes in, in, in English. So that was something that I thought was really interesting. But I suppose the dynamics are a bit different though, aren't they? Because, I mean, I know the, the footnotes in Arabic literature in English is a bit feeds into this whole, like, you know, all the, the Orient it's difficult and it needs explaining and thank goodness we have these excellent scholars who went to Oxford who can explain it to us and that has that sort of history attached to it whereas you know I can understand that the sort of cultural baggage isn't the same going the other way um but that is very interesting uh I mean you know in Radha Salman's Arabic books she has footnotes herself in yeah. the Arabic, where she explains, you know, some English word that she's dropped transliterated in Arabic, like folklore or something like that. She'll explain it in the footnote or something that's particularly Shami, you know, particular to the Syrian. Yeah, dialect. Muhammad al has done the same thing and he just won the IPAF, right? Yeah. So like, it's not seen as something 
sorry to cut you off, but yeah, really contemporary examples. Like it's not seen as something unusual. Do we see that in, in Iranian literature? Like, um, it depends. Even in the Farsi? Yeah, it depends. Sometimes, uh, like you mentioned, the transliterations of, you know, words that are used in, the transliteration is used in the text and then in the footnotes, you have the Latin uh, yeah. written, yeah. Yeah. But I like footnotes because <laughs> you can get more information about it. It kind of breaks the flow of the reading too. So yeah, I have double feeling. Um, we're almost out of time, but Rade, if you have a very quick question, you can um, unmute. Now. Yes, I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be very brief. Thanks so much for this. This is brilliant. I'm actually speaking from Canada and I'm driving, but I've enjoyed this so much. And I just wanted to, yes, I am, I promise. But I just wanted to add something about the translator's notes. It's something um, that I've really, really grappled with for a long time. And I just finished translating a piece um, for Brahim Samoil, who is a political Syrian prisoner, an ex-political Syrian prisoner now in Jordan. And um, the piece, it's on Arab lit. It, um, it's called the bathroom and he speaks about a bathroom that's built within uh, the prison um, with a, within a prison dormitory in Syria and so I was just not able to comprehend the story myself as a Syrian because I'd never been in you know that that space that unimaginable unfathomable space that he's describing and it's the the most important and central piece to this structure is a bathroom that is shared by 60 people in a dormitory and you have to understand the space and the place and the the way this whole um you know prison dormitory is built in order to understand the the, the theme of the story so i spoke to him personally and he explained it to me and i couldn't imagine not putting that translator's note in to explain again something that's completely unfathomable to not only an English reader but to the human mind. So yeah. I I do feel like there are places and spaces that the translator's note is just incredibly necessary. Although I can see all um, perspectives that were expressed here, and I echo quite a bit of them too. So thanks for this. Thank it's you. Brilliant. Thank you. That's so interesting. Yeah, I guess there's some things that are just so foreign, no matter what, that we that they need to be glossed <laughs> for all of us. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you to our panelists, Pune, Larry, Savad. Thank you so much for joining us and for giving us your insights into the philosophy and practice of translation. We look forward to seeing all of your work, whether uh, coming into English fiction, nonfiction, poetry. We want to see it all. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to all of our participants and presenters and everybody for being so wonderful today and engaging. Uh, we will see you again bright and early tomorrow for more papers. Um, I ran out of steam. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank and you so much, Leila, for everything today. Co-organizers, oh, thank you so much, everyone. This was great. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.